say hello to everybody this evening. We thank God for uh, being able to come and, and share. We've got some exciting things going on. Give me a second here. Uh, one second, we got it. All right. Uh, we've got some exciting, uh, exciting platform, exciting guests. I'm excited about being here tonight. Let's pray that we'll get right into the topic of discussion. Father, tonight we thank you for uh, such an opportunity a platform, literally, we're reaching the world. This is a global platform. So we ask you, God, to empower us this evening in our words, our speech, give us wisdom, give us what we need to reach this generation. It's our heart's desire. It should be glorified that men's lives will be transformed for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I'm glad you could make it on, make it to, on tonight. I want to, again, ask everyone, if you please mute your phones. Uh, except for, uh, of course, our guests, and that is uh, Lou Buck and Keith David. I'm going to allow them to share and talk. Uh, I, I personally, uh, I'm grateful to God for allowing me to be here today and be alive. And, and I have a heart for men. And I have a heart for souls. And certainly, as a man, uh, I love to see men delivered and set free. And so this is my natural flow. Uh, we have my good friend, uh, Mr. Lou Brock Jr., and I'll let, let you let him tell you who, who he is. The name the name says something. He'll talk about that, I'm sure. And uh, of course, our, our guest speaker for this coming Saturday and Sunday, uh, Mr. Keith Davis. They will go ahead and share a little bit about themselves, and then we'll get right into the meat of the matter. Lou, I'll let you go first. Well, thank you, Bishop. Uh, it's absolutely my pleasure to be here tonight, and uh, I can uh, I really. To talk about myself, but I, I'm excited to talk about Brother Keith Davis here because uh, it was back in 1984 we were playing uh, together at Southern Cal. Keith was a strong rock, standing in uh, standing against the stream for the Lord. You know anything about a football locker room? You know you got a lot of strong personalities. You got gladiators. You got guys who. You know, that those are the guys that you want to get into a fight with. And uh, and Keith was in the locker room and he was unbending in his belief and his faith in God. And Keith always told me, he said, Lou, man, come to Bible study. You got a heart for the Lord. Come to Bible study. He kept on me. Finally, I went. And boy, uh, when I found out the truth, it just hadn't stopped since then. And so uh, Keith and I got a lot of good stories. Uh, there's some people who are just saved and do things, but then there's some people who are warriors that actually go out and look and undo the work of the devil. And uh, uh, that's the kind of brother you have here, Keith Davis. And, and uh, I know you told me to talk about me, Bishop, but I, I just had to <laughs> talk about Keith there. All right. So I'm going to bring up the scripture, Bishop. Uh, the Proverbs, it says, let another man praise you and not your own lips. So let me talk about my brother, Lou. Let's talk a little football first. Uh, we know the brother's name, but I just want to say, for those who don't know, Lou was one of the fastest defensive backs you ever saw in your life. I mean, he was like a, a gazelle running across the field. And then obviously, uh, after playing at Southern Cal, and Lou, you were in that one Rose Bowl with us, right? You were in the Oh yeah. Well, the yeah, first yeah. One. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we had a couple of up and down years at USC. USC has always been, as you guys all know, even there in the Midwest, uh, a perennial powerhouse. And Lou and I played in one Rose Bowl together. I got a chance to go in a couple of other ones after Lou left, and then Lou was drafted um, very, very high by a team called the San Diego Chargers, which I guess they're pretty good now, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and then. Uh, and, and then obviously, as he mentioned, man, uh, for all the brothers that are on the line, we, 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 uh, we were very passionate about the game of football, which so many men are, uh, and very passionate about our faith in God. And Lou mentioned battles, and football is a great analogy as a man because the thing about football is very different than many other sports. You know, baseball, you'll strike out, and then they say you're out after three strikes, but football... Uh, everyone gets knocked down, but the true test of a great player is how they get back up. Uh, it says a righteous man may fall seven times, but rises up again. And so all of us on this line are just learning how to rise up. And uh, 
And so I was an inside linebacker. Lou was a cornerback. And, um, and then I went on after a USC, I went to a team called the New York Giants. Um, and at that time, it was a different era in football. So linebackers were really, really big and strong. So I was one of the biggest, strongest uh, players on the team at that time. And bench pressing a lot of weight, as Lou knows. I spent all my time in the weight room and then just trying to be strong in our face. So it's just great to be on. And then, Bishop, thank you so much. And for all the other brothers, we're excited just to have a little time to encourage one another in our faith and in the Lord. Absolutely. Uh, Lou, of course, uh, is a very humble guy. Lou Brock is the son of the great Lou Brock. He has the name Lou Brock Jr. So those that know, and no question about it, you know Lou Brock. So this is Mr. Lou Brock Jr. So I thought throw that yes. out, Lou. I know you don't necessarily uh, like like keep that in secrecy, but I thought put it out there. Well, yeah, we'll, we, we'll brag on him. We'll brag on him, Bishop. Just keep bragging. There you go. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> well, guys, listen. Uh, we're excited tonight. We're gonna get right into the meat of the matter. Um, talking about uh, the king inside of us is, is going to be our theme, is our theme uh, for this weekend as well. So let me just share uh, just a brief uh, overview or definition of the word king. Uh, the word king is defined as the male ruler of an independent state, especially one who inherits the position by right of birth. Uh, it is a male ruler of a country who usually inherits his position or rules for life. Um, look, I'm a, I don't play chess now, but I used to play chess. Let me, let me say this. When I read the definition, the thing, the thing that stuck out to me was the fact that in both definitions, in this instance, the word that was clearly distinctive was that he is a male. So, uh, again, it's clear that a woman, a queen, can't be a king. And in this instance, it says that the king inherits the position by right. Now, as I mentioned, I used to play chess years ago. I don't play chess now. But the most uh, powerful piece on the board in terms of its, its uh, position is the king. Uh, you think about uh, chess, those who are chess enthusiasts, the one player that determines the rise or the fall of the kingdom on the chessboard is the king. And it is every piece, the rook, the bishop, the knight, the palms, uh, every piece's job is to protect the king. That's, a, that's an interesting thought. If you think about it, Jesse said checkmate, and then check. Obviously, we say checkmate, your, your king is threatened. Checkmate says he's over, he's immobile, he's done. So we're going to talk about the king tonight. We're going to yes. talk about the king in us, all right? Uh, we are uniquely, distinctively different as men, and uh, we're going to talk about that. So uh, let's get into... Um, uh, the topic number uh, number one, we'll talk about social challenges men face today. Of course, we deal with uh, uh, stereotypical portraits of men, uh, the media, the culture. Uh, of course, uh, some was referenced men in terms of ha having a high sex drive. And we, we was talking about sex, uh, uh, this superhero perspective, strong, you know, you got to be strong. I was talking to Keith and to uh, Lou earlier. Because uh, I'm a little older than most of you guys, Lou and I. Probably, well, I'm probably older than Lou too, but I remember. And you all probably can remember. Uh, most of the movies we watched, particularly African Americans, uh, our roles either was a slave, or we'd be the first one to die. We very rarely would see black men in uh, in in relationships and really showing uh, emotions. And so, uh, let's talk about that. What what are some of the social challenges, uh, Lou Keith? Uh, that we as men deal with? What do we, in terms of racism, in terms of sexism? Let's talk about that. Yeah, I, I think, uh, first of all, you mentioned um, the image that we even saw among ourselves, you know, growing up. So those social challenges, obviously, from a righteous standpoint of just providing for our family, um, and then obviously the social challenges of, um, you know, our, 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 our testosterone, our sex drive, uh, and then black men, maybe they have a, there's a preconceived idea among other people of violence or whatever that may be. But, um, I think one of the things I, I would like to just kind of highlight on is just that, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that image of, uh, uh, of, a of a, of a Christian, Lou mentioned something at the beginning. So, you know, we don't see a lot of men who are 
passionate for for God, who are strong, who are mighty and passionate for God. So um, I'm born and raised right in South Central L.A. And so the imagery was always it was either uh, a, a, a lot of gang banging, you know, a lot of violence. Uh, and so a lot there was a lot of bloods and crips in my in my family and in my neighborhood. And then all of my cousins, I didn't have a father, but all of my cousins had multiple women and multiple baby mamas, you know what I mean? And so even me growing up, that was almost a kind of a, a imagery that was set in my mind. And so it wasn't until the word of God began to change all of that. And that was almost kind of your status of your manhood was like how many women you had or how many you could run or how much of a player you were, you know what I mean? So that was always uh, uh a, a challenge, you know, in, in terms of fighting, you know, when you have light and dark and then you have so many things pulling you from one way to another. But those are imageries that I had, you know, just growing up there in South Central L.A. for sure. So how did that impact you in terms of obviously you've been transformed, but prior yeah. to transformation, uh, how did that cultural, you know, uh, barrier, so to speak, impact your overall thinking? Yeah, so I, I, I just, I, I mean, you know, let's let's just kind of just be transparent. Um, it really, it, uh, Bishop and them for my brothers on the line, it really, it really messed me up. And what I'm saying is, um, so so um, my father committed suicide when I was really young. Uh, my father was selling drugs. My father committed suicide. And then my mother was left by herself with nothing. And my mother went from one place to the next, to the next. She couldn't pay the rent and everything. So then she got one boyfriend after another. And then, you know, the one boyfriend that was helping her with the bills, then she decided to let this dude move in. And then there was one violent dude move in, another one move out, another one move in. And, uh, but then, and then in terms of those men that I looked up to. So I lived on a street uh, that was just filled with a whole, I mean, hundreds of low income housing. And so on that street were a lot of uh, older dudes that I thought were extremely cool. And I remember, you know, being like 12, 13, 14, not only the dudes on my street, but I remember my cousin, you know, he just had all these cars and all these women. And I, I really wanted to be like that. I wanted that. You know what I mean? I mean, he had the freshest clothes, the freshest cars. The freshest women, I mean, they were beautiful. You know what I mean? It was always another one. Every family get together, he had one with him. And so I thought like that was like it. And uh, I think, you know, those type of uh, things, especially as a young man, can really pull you in different ways. And I'm sharing that because right before the program, I was just meditating on a verse that uh, there's a book that I, I, I've been reading. It's called Maximize Manhood. It's a very powerful book. But there's a verse in there, and it says in Psalms 101, verse 6, uh, in the Living Bible, it simply says, it says, I will make the godly of the land my heroes, and I will invite them into my home. And I thought about just being at that age, 13, 14, 15, not, not having any godly heroes whatsoever. So, so I desired that, you know what I mean? I desired, especially... In South Central LA, you're seeing all of these things, and this is what gives you the status as a mighty man. If you can, if you can drink like that and have women like that, you know that was like a thing that I desired, and um, so it was a very much of a challenge for me, you know, renewing my mind once I did come to the Lord. So, Lou, uh, let's hear from you. So, uh, yeah, you know, the imagery that we get in the United States of America is not conducive to the end goal that we want to get to. But let me open it by saying this. The United States of America is the place on this planet that I'm glad God put me, right? I mean, there's countries where you can't worship Jesus Christ or they're going to behead you. There's countries where the Bible is, is, is against the law. There's, a, there's worse places to be on the planet than the United States of America. And at least in the United States of America, we can worship Jesus as we want to. And that's the most important thing. Now, with that being said, uh, you know, the image that the black man gets shows no purpose. And so our kids have this 
no purpose attitude that they go out and try to find a purpose or try to, you know, if they don't, if they don't find God to find their kingdom purpose and you're looking for that earthly purpose and it eludes you, what happens is, I think as Keith talked about, you kind of go with the flow. Yeah. And it takes a real strong person to stand against that flow. And if we want to make substantive change in our culture, we have to stand against that flow. And that's not an easy thing to do because, you know, uh, we are a social creature, Bishop, that, you know, wants to fit into society. But when you want to fit into a society that says you really have no purpose in this society, how do you fit in? And so we do things to try to fit in, which is conforming. Could we conform to these images that we see or we conform to these wants that we have? Whereas the way to success is actually not to conform to those, to stand up against those. And it takes a strong person. It takes the Holy Spirit to be in your vessel in order to do that. And a person that comes to, you know, I think of in the Bible is, uh, you know, John the Baptist. I mean, think about what people thought about him. Yeah. And think about his social, how he stood up against all that ridicule, all that you are what we expect. But then look at his placement and his kingdom purpose and what God had him here for. I mean, those are two totally different things. And I know which one you can put my name up under the list to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Bishop. Well, and no, I was just going to say, Lou, um, you know, you, you're, you're so true. And so, uh, Bishop, just a little bit into my testimony as well. So, um, you know, me getting a chance to go to a great, great university like USC, um, you know, I, I went to probably 19 different schools before I got out of high school. And so the imagery of, again, like education was not a thing that was esteemed in my community. You know, it was like, if you could ball, you were respected, you know, or if you were a gangster, you were respected. But if you were like a, a student that was very much into your books and went to school, you know, especially as a kid, they, they laugh and kind of make fun of you. But I remember, like Lou was saying, kind of going against the flow. And um, I remember having a prayer, you know, God, God, please don't let me be another black player that doesn't graduate. Um, so when I got to USC, I was about 17 or 18 years old. And, um, you know, the Bible says in Psalms um, 119, verse 99, it says, his word will make you wiser than your teachers. And one of the things that happened is I went from the very, very lowest academically. I had all kind of remedial issues and reading problems to graduating the very, very highest, highest GPA, dean's list, academic All-American. And it was just like, um, Lou, what you were saying, you know, be not conformed to this world, but being transformed. And it's the same even with our fatherhood. You know, I'm now, I have a beautiful wife and two beautiful sons, and, but no one in my family has been married. You know what I mean? My mother had seven sisters, two brothers, and all of them had just multiple kids by different people. So I was like the first one to actually like have a like a legitimate family and be married and, and stay married, you know? And so, and these type of things, these are battles that we, as men are fighting for righteousness, we're fighting this. It's a fight because everything's pulling at us to keep us away from those types of That's right. things that edify us, that edify our family, and edify us as people. You understand what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, you might not know this, Keith, but my church is literally five minutes from where Mike Brown was killed. Wow. Uh, so I was uh, at home that night, particularly watching I don't know what I was watching, but anyway, CNN broke in and uh, buildings on fire, riots. And I was almost petrified because I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what's going on? You know, it's literally it's down the street from my church. Yeah. And um, I watched and I assessed and I prayed, obviously. So the next day I got a call from, you know, county executive, the governor's office, a community leaders was calling me because I'm one of the gatekeepers of the community. And they were calling me, asking me, you know, my opinion, I was, matter of fact, I was interviewed by CNN. And what I emphasize to all of the above is we're not just watching young men rioting. We're watching young men that are broken. Mm. Are. Yeah. We're watching yeah. young men that are, that are hurting and that are, that have been, you know, exposed to poverty. Uh, where there's poverty, there's going to be crime. Uh, there'll yeah. be violence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
the unemployment rate in that particular community was like 24% for ages 14 to 17. So, so we're looking at a, at a generation, this is global, well, throughout the United States. When people are hurting, anger is just the, anger is the byproduct of the pain, hmm. you know? Yeah. And so often uh, society don't really understand the undercurrent of, of, of what's going on. They see the anger. They see the violence. They see, you know, young black men, so to speak, out there doing things that obviously is affecting the community, but they don't understand that there's an undercurrent here, and often that anger is undiagnosed because it's not dealing with the root cause. Uh, yeah. We did we did some study and they, this iceberg analogy, and they talked about the anger on top is really there's seven layers of, or six layers of pain and uh, dysfunctionalism on the bottom. But what yeah, people see yeah. often. It's just, it's just the anger. So mm. society says they're angry, but no, they're, they're not just angry, but they're broken. And sometimes we miss that. Yeah, yeah. And I think, thanks so, thanks so much for just the ministry you have to men and just even us being able to share on this line. Um, so Lou and I, uh, we got a group of about five or six of us and we try to take some time you know, we, we, you know, men always got stuff going on, but, you know, just take some time just to encourage one another. And I'm just sharing that for the brothers on the line that I don't know. It's just something about brothers encouraging and edifying each other. Um, and then, Bishop, we talked a little earlier about um, just receiving a, a, an emotional deposit from a man. And, um, and, and that being said, um, you know, in the middle of those times as a teenager or even a young man at 20 years old, um, I, I remember uh, there was a man who just began to really encourage me in the word. He really was like a mentor. And I, I think I think we should all have mentors in our life at whatever age or stage that we're at, because I think we all need it. I think we all need a boost. If you know anything, my wife was a world class uh, all American sprinter. Uh, her team was the fastest women's team in the nation. Uh, lots of gold medalists on that team but they all have like individual coaches They're, I mean, they're extremely fast, but they still have a coach that helps them <laughs> in their speed even more. And, um, you know, I've had young guys who I know I speak a lot who are still playing in the NFL. They made defensive linemen and they're great D linemen. They know how to pass rush, but then in the off season, they even have a pass rushing coach to help them just that little bit much, that much more, just in hopes of getting to the QB one or two more times during our, throughout the year. And I'm just sharing that with all my brothers today to say that it's just something about having, uh, you know, a man in our lives to speak life to us, to speak hope to us. Uh, it says his words, they are spirit and they are life. In John 6, 63, Jesus says, my words, they are spirit in their life. And sometimes we as men, we, 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 we can lose our spirit. I mean, we got job hitting us this way, maybe wife hitting us this way. Maybe we had an outside relationship and now we have a child with somebody else hitting us this way. And we have financial issues hitting us this way. We got all these things hitting us, but you know, we want to still be filled with, with joy and with hope so that it can flow out of us to our families and to our kids. But sometimes we just need a boost. And so it's good and pleasant, like the Bible says for us, to dwell together in unity, even if it's on Zoom, you know. <laughs> so. Absolutely. So, so you, you, it's a great segue. Let me, let me. Um, you talk about emotional health and get that emotion deposit. Let me define emotional health. Then let's discuss it. Uh, emotional health is a state of positive psychological function. It can be thought of as an extension of mental health. It is the optimal functioning end of the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that make up both our inner and outer worlds. It includes an overall experience of wellness in what we think, feel, and go through both the highs and the lows of life. Now, that's the comprehensive definition of mm. emotional health. But in layman's term, as you just referenced, it is, it is receiving that emotion deposit from a male species. So mm. now, that's why it's important. Uh, so I was, I was raised by my stepfather. Now he was, he, you know, he was a phenomenal provider, but from my sports, never my games, uh, my wrestling matches, uh, never that impact in terms of emotional deposit. And so I grew up, as a matter of fact, I didn't really get healed until I was like 35 years old because I longed for my father, my, my biological father. Uh, but again, I made a decision that uh, I'm going to be 
uh, present for my kids, number one. And of course, having grandkids, you know, I'm present with them because I understand that particularly my four grandsons that I, I, I can do what their mothers cannot do. I can, mm. I can make a deposit that, uh, yeah. that the women cannot make. And I respect women and what they do. We, we take our hats off to the women who have been uh, pillars in our lives, but a woman will never be a man. So yeah. let's talk about how important is it, Lou, if you can answer this question, uh, to receive the most positive from a man. How important is it? Well, I think it's very important. You know, uh, I guess to keep the theme of the, the flow, you know, if you have men and you go into a flow, it's, it's easier when everybody's on one accord. And it's, you know, we talk about football, so let's talk about it from, you know, terms that people would understand. Keith talked about how he and I encourage and uplift each other now. And we've been to battles together, right? <clears throat> we prepared for battle and we battled together. And in those battles, there's a lot of emotion. And those battles aren't just on the football field. But being in that, we are able to now have the avenue the confidence in each other to deposit into each other. Because if I didn't have the, that, that experience with Keith, then what he says to me now comes to me a different way. And so let me give you, let me give you a story real quick that I hope will really you know, uh, make this gel. There was a night uh, at USC where uh, the team chaplain come, well, I think Keith and, and two other brothers, uh, three other brothers. We were all sitting in an apartment. We were just playing games and talking. And the teen chaplain called us and said, hey, let's go up to Westwood. And, uh, let's do some street corner preaching. And we were like, well, you know, we're not doing much else. And I was a pretty new Christian. I didn't know what they was really going to do. So I'm just going to go out there and, you know, try to see what's going on. So we went out to Westwood, which if anybody knows what Westwood is in L.A., it's kind of like the, the end spot, you know, up by Hollywood, in between Hollywood and UCLA and You'll see everything out walking around at night. So he went to the corner and he just started to get a crowd. He was saying, hey, who wants to raise hell? We're going to raise hell right here on this street corner. Come on, get a crowd up. And he, he got about, you know, just talking that way. He got about 40 people to stop. And they was all screaming, yeah, let's raise hell. Let's raise. So finally, he pulled out a Bible and he said, when I say raise hell, I'm talking about cut it up and get rid of it. I'm going to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and right away, half the crowd just left, right? But then there's those people that did stay behind. Now, while he was, you know, start preaching about Jesus, there was a, he would, now he was a white guy and we were three, we were four brothers, right? That would went with him. And uh, <laughs> this guy's, pulled up a, a crate, like a, a wooden bat off of a crate. And he was sneaking up behind the guy who was street preaching and he was going to whop him with this bat. And Keith, looking like the Incredible Hulk, you know, he was bench pressing 525 pounds back then, right? Neck come from his ears down to his traps. And <laughs> that little guy was sneaking up behind Tom and was just he was about to swing. The, Keith looked at him and said, what you going to do? <laughs> man that little guy thought he he said wait a minute this big old brother's oh please mr sir <laughs> but that was an experience in the trenches so when i when bishop when i said early on that you you know attacking the work of the devil keith and i've done that together in stories like that right so when you have that camaraderie amongst men then it's much easier now when, when Keith uh, you know when I was having some challenges at the end of last year Keith didn't know about it he called me we were talking and then I told him about it and he's like man look we just gonna believe God right now let's just pray right and um, airport yeah and so those are um, divine appointments those are divine relationships I think those are set out, you know, Bishop, you and I have a divine relationship. Okay. And I think that men need to find their di divine relationship, those relationships that were intended to exist and to benefit the kingdom before we were even born. Absolutely. The Bible says iron sharp as iron. And yeah. to your point, um, again, 
listen, brother, let's keep it real. We need each other. As you said, mm -hmm. Keith has been there for you, you for him. You and I have a great relationship. We need to be able to be authentic with each other. Uh, that deposit in terms of the mental deposit comes from being authentic, uh, connecting with one another, being transparent. Let's keep it real. As young folks, keep, keep 100. No sense of us faking. Men, listen to me, men lead the nation in murder-suicide. Mm. A man is more likely to go into the house and kill everybody more so than a woman. Now, a woman, mm. she, she might get you, but she's just going to get you. But men, <laughs> hear me today, they, because we tend to internalize, you know, our situations, we keep it to ourselves, we suppress our emotions, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So that's not healthy for us. And I was doing some study the other day, and it stated that 80% uh, of major illnesses are stress-related. Listen to this. Stress shrinks the brain. Number one, as you get older, the brain shrinks. And then stress just perpetuates that, that shrinking of the brain. So it's really important that we have an, an access or have an exit ramp, so to speak, to get off the ramp where we don't commit suicide, where we don't have a nervous breakdown, where we're in a weak mode. We can call someone and talk about our issues. And so that emotional deposit is critical, and especially for us as African American men, because we need each other. Yeah, uh, Bishop, if I can kind of add to that as well, uh, and this is just for all of my brothers on the line that have children also. So we definitely need each other. That is without a doubt. Um, and a lot of men don't have close relationships. For whatever reason, I mean, you know, very much of us are, are guarded. Again, we have our own ego and personas that we have to keep. And it's, it's very hard for men to kind of get past the peripheral and to come into kind of that covenant relationship. Um, but then I want to just go one step further, maybe in something that we have or hasn't been modeled to us. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, well, my sons, I have two sons, and I mean, they're older now. One son just finished graduate school. My other one finished graduate school uh, two years ago. Um, and, uh, but from the time they were born, I mean, like little bitty babies, uh, Bishop, I would take these big old giant hands that lift 500 and some pounds, and I would just put it on their heads, and I would just speak the word. And I just say, the Lord bless you and keep you. His favor surround you like a shield. You will be the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. Bless coming in and bless going out. And I speak, you know, I just, I just had a whole, I had a little sheet. I would just write words that I felt were good, inspiring to me and for them. You know, in the book of Daniel chapter one, I would like, I would speak, you know, you're well favored, apt in learning, able to stand before kings. Um, and, and so uh, when my sons, you know, they got to about like seven, eight years old, they started like saying it before I would finish it, you know, and I'll say, you know, you'll be the head and they go not the tail. And so <laughs> then they, when they looked at the report card, if it was really, really good. I said, that's just, that's expected, right? Because you're the head and they go, go not the tail, you know, <laughs> and all these things. Um, but then something happened. It was funny. I mean, some of the men will laugh on the line. So I'm, you know, I'm really big, man. I'm like 290 or something like that. And um, so my son, he got to be about like 13, 14, no, he's about 14, 15 years old, maybe. And he's a big kid. And um, <laughs> my wife and I were uh, just kind of hanging out in the living room and my, <laughs> and my son, he's like 15 years old. He just came and said, uh, is, is somebody going to put me to bed? <laughs> He's like, you think of like a 15-year-old saying, is somebody going to put me to bed? <laughs> but really what he was saying was, can, can you bless me before I go to bed? My God. You know, so I, I got it. I, I just stood up and I said, come in, you know, and I, I mean, he's high, he's big as me by then. So I just, you know, put my hand on his head and just start speaking blessing over him, over his gift, you know, and make room for him and stand before great men and and I'm only sharing this because as some of us have already articulated you know you're growing up in a house where there are no men you know and then the men that were there were extremely just ungodly brutal violent everything you could think of the opposite of what a father should be and so now we have this word that we're reading it's like a mirror in us and 
And it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And so that being said, you know, in this hour call that we have, one of the things that we all can do is even if we don't have an emotional deposit, maybe we don't have an older man in our life or have a friend, but we can just make that from this point on, at least I'm going to put an emotional deposit into my son or into my daughter, at least for now, yeah. you know, and it, it has to be something formal. I mean, it can grow into something like, kind of like I was saying, but just some type of way, let's impart something like that because those words are not just words. Those are living quick and powerful words. So I think it's just a word of encouragement for all of us as men, because and then if we get into black men, again, as we were talking about, you know, just many of us have had, um, you know, there are hurdles to jump, but a lot of us as brothers have jumped hurdles that seemingly people said we can't get over, but we're getting over and we're moving. We're at world record pace. And so let's let our children begin to jump the hurdles even better and then let their spirits be healthy and inspired and up uplifted. So anyways, just my word of encouragement for my brothers. Yeah. So Bishop, I would, I'm just going to have some real simple. If you think about what Keith said, you think about what you said and draw that back to what you said in the beginning about kings. Yes. Yes. A, wow. king, yes. Yeah. a king has to accept the responsibility. If a mm. person, if a person is born as a king and he doesn't accept the responsibility, he's not the king. Mm. He's resigned his throne. Right. So, I think the, the first thing that we're talking about and what Keith was just sharing is that he accepted the responsibility. Yeah. And I think then you can be king. Once you accept the responsibility, then you can be a king. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, as you were talking, Keith, uh, you know, because I'm the father of three daughters and because a wife, um, I was, I had, to, I had to stretch emotionally because there was a pull on me um, from the wife and the girls that I didn't have the capacity to give them, quite frankly, mm. because, because uh, you know, a mother single parent, she worked, you know, she just, she was a provider, you know, so she would yeah. just grow up saying, I love your son, love your mother. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. We got older, but so I was challenged and being a pastor, my girls would say to me, well, we don't want the pastor, we want our dad. And mm. I'd be like, you know, as a disciplinary and as a man of order structure, you know, so I was somewhat disconnected, but they challenged me to, to take off these titles and these hats and who you are to people and be our father. And so with that challenge, I had to get, I had to develop emotionally because I didn't have the capacity. And frankly, mm -hmm. uh, to your point, I didn't know how to be an emotional depositor. Yeah. Didn't know how, but through the Holy Ghost and humility. And I had to, you know, we have this somewhat this self-righteousness about us. We, we, we're providing, we're paying the bills, all that stuff. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's fundamental. You know, when it comes to being a man, there's another angle here. And that angle is now we have to learn how to how to give ourselves emotionally. So I had to develop that capacity uh, that I didn't have. And God helped me. But it was a tearful process. You know what I'm telling you? Yeah, yeah, it was very yeah, painful yeah. because I had to go against, you know, this state of, well, I'm a great father and I do this and all that. They didn't care about that. They wanted me to be able to, as a man, give them what they could not give themselves. Mm. Wow. As... At, okay, if I can just uh, elaborate a little bit on that um, for my brothers on the line, I, you know, one of the things I do, um, I started way, way, way back when I was in college. Um, I have a program around the nation where I'm, I'm literally, I don't know, I've probably spoken in more than uh, 25,000 schools throughout the years uh, in 63 countries. And I'm getting to this for a reason, Pastor. So you imagine 63 countries from Africa, Nigeria, to South Africa, to Egypt, to Japan, to Australia, to everywhere you could imagine. 25,000 schools or more, I can't even add it up, millions of young people. And one of the things I hear over and over and over, because I'm in the schools literally every day, at least four days a week, sometimes five, multiple schools, and kids just talk to me and they, they like pour their heart out. And I hear that from the young ladies, Pastor. Exactly what you were just saying, you know, my father, they, they want that. They want that connection with their, with their father. They, and specifically with their father. And, 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 and they don't even know me. They met me just that day and like they're sharing all this. And so it's kind of like I got my ear to the ground in terms of 
what this next generation is desiring. I know everybody's flashing on Instagram and showing what they got and everybody on Twitter, but like when you get past all of that, because we go real deep, our assemblies are real hype, fun, this and that, then it gets real, real, real deep. Tears are like flowing. And then they are sharing with me that desire, what they want from you. And then young men are wanting exactly what you're talking about on this show. They're wanting an impartation. You know, they, they might not say an emotional impartation, but they're wanting a, a, an emotional, spiritual, relational connection with a man who has their best interests at heart. Yeah. A man who says, you, you got what it takes. You know, you can do it. So it's really, really, really powerful time because there's some healing that needs to take place. And I think that's one of our prayers. You know, we pray for all these things, but I'm, I'm really... Sometimes I say, God, help me to pray for the things that you want. You know, help me to help me to see the way you see. And you know, I, sometimes it's real. I, even pe people speak in all these different languages, and I have translators that are translate. And even through all languages, I can still feel the emotion. It's the same thing, you know. And whether they're wealthy or poor, it's the same thing. It's just this one thing, you know. I think about the verse in um, in Joel. It says, "Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision." in the dead Lord, so multitudes. And then there are, are millions of men, black men who are not maybe on this call, who are desiring the same thing, that connection. They're desiring, we're all, we're desiring, and we're desiring to be built up. And I know God gives it to us. And then he gives us divine relationships, but but we, 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 we really have to fight for this thing. As you said, like a king, we really have to, we really have to push forward to press in to try to, receive that thing we're hungering for. We're hungry and thirsty for it. Yeah, we got to fight for it. So, and yeah. Bishop, you said that earlier, you get to fight. It is not yeah, easy. Yeah. You know, the, the, the easy road is heavily traveled and it leads nowhere. Right. And yeah. you find everybody can take the easy road. Easy road with the flow. It yeah. is hard to stand up. And what I would say to the brothers on the call here is that, you know, even if you didn't get that emotional deposit from the generation above you, as Bishop was saying, he didn't know how when he first you go, got the challenge to do it. But if you just say the buck stops here, right? It's going to work from what happened before where I didn't get the deposit. That's okay. God helped me from here to make the deposit as I go forward from here. And start it. Be the one to start it. You heard Keith talk about how he was the guy who his family that was the one that started the family unit and started yeah. the educational experience be the person yeah. to start the emotional deposit in your lineage and let, yeah. and let god be the one to teach you you don't have to have had a human teacher above you like if your father wasn't in your life it can still happen mm. yeah start a start a new tradition you know and, and that's it right to, i listened to keith he was saying even some of the wealthiest kids so apparently money is not the answer what no, you're happening? so true, for real. Yeah. Definitely true. Yeah. I, I've, <laughs> that's, that was actually the biggest wake-up call for me. Um, again, you know, just getting the exposure that I have in terms of, like, every day. I'm, I'm, you know, once one day I'm in the inner city, the next day I'm in the suburbs, the next day I'm in extremely wealthy place, the next day I'm in, in the rural area, and the next day I'm in some foreign, you know, place in Brazil or Bolivia. or But the the money part was really the wake up because I began to see, and you know, you don't grow up, at least a lot of us hadn't grown up around it, maybe Lou, but <laughs> I'm messing with you, Lou. <laughs> oh, <that's true. laughs> you know, but I'm saying a lot of us hadn't grown up around a lot of wealthy, uh, you know, in a school where everybody was wealthy or a school where everybody had everything and everything. And then I began to go to these schools and I said, man, they got more needs than they got more needs than our schools over here in South Central LA or Ferguson or wherever else. You know, it's just really amazing. It's just all peripheral. You know, everything looks nice on the outside, but man, it's the issues that parents are going through. And then just this, 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 this uh, void that we have. I know it's a cliche, you know, there's a God shaped vacuum in us that only Christ can feel, but it is really true. There is a vacuum. And people are trying everything they can to fill these gaps that are in their lives. And, uh, and so we as men, whether we have children or not, maybe you got nephews on this line, maybe you got cousins, 
you know, even when I didn't have any kids, I remember my little cousins and nephews and some of them, you know, their mamas was smoked out and stuff was going, man, I would just pray for them. I would just grab them and pray for them. You know, if I had four, five dollars, I'd give it to them, try to help them. But, but it was just trying to be there for them. And, and, um, and I think all of us can do that just with our families and with our church. Because in our church, there are a lot of single moms who are trying to raise these boys. And we can be that kind of in-between. We can be that, that bridge, you know, that gap. Because the, really, the reality is, the way I started really reading the scriptures and learning it, uh, maybe I had some books that inspired me, but <clears throat> I remember there's this one man at this church and he just felt like it was his calling to kind of um, connect young inner city boys together. So he'd have different events. And then he uh, just only the young and his church was predominantly black. So it was all young black men. But he had different events to kind of get us together. And we were all like 16 years old, 17. And he would always share any question we ever asked him. He would never answer it. He would just give us a Bible verse. <laughs> and we thought, we said, how can this dude? answer every question with a Bible verse. And we'd read the verse and it was like the answer to the question. And we just thought that was amazing. Like, you know, and I only reason I was going to the church because my mom had got saved and she asked me to go and I really wasn't into it. But then I met this guy and he began to just inspire us. And he wasn't our father, he wasn't my cousin, he wasn't anything, but he really sparked an interest in me because I said, man, this is some real wisdom. And it really began to help me. So, I'm, so each of us have a place that we can bridge the gap and connect, you know, whether it's our cousins, our own children, our sons or our daughters, or even, even those in our church, you know, we all have an assignment. The harvest is great and the labors are few. The, labors are the Lord, send me. Amen. Yeah. Send so, me. Bishop, if I could throw in something here, because I, there's an important point I want to talk about the money aspect of it in the, in the wealth. So, yeah, Keith is right. You know, I, I went to school with a lot of people who were retired before they even got it through grade school. Right. They were born retired because <laughs> they had they had trust funds that they had before they were born. They were done. Right. Yeah. And and then on the other end of the spectrum. So God has put me through the whole spectrum. I've been around those families, spent the night over at, at, at families like that, where, you know, the, the, the house cook is going to cook everything. When you want a sandwich, you got someone going to cook it. Right. <laughs> but also at the same time, Bishop, you talked about Michael Brown there in Ferguson. You know, my cousin and Michael Brown had the same, we had the same cousin, right? So uh, you know, I, I have family that is on the spectrum, you know, the under, other end of the spectrum. You know, I I, I spent time in the poor to poor down in yeah. South Central, Keith and my cousins, we used to go down. Yeah, and he yeah, screams, yeah. screams down at my cousin's house there in South Central, <laughs> right where that guy got bricked in the riots, right? That was right yeah. around the corner. Uh, and I will tell you this between poor and rich. Whoever you are as a person, if you're broken, <laughs> that's what the money's going to bring out. In, and there's no difference. There's no difference. The money does not solve anything. And I'll tell you what does solve. What is the difference? The difference is having a purpose. Yeah. You find a person, you, you even find them in the in the in San Diego. We used to go and, and, and minister, they call it the barrio. They don't call it the ghetto in San Diego, they call it the barrio. You can find a kid with a purpose, and he's gonna make it out of the barrio. He's gonna make it, he's gonna go against the flow, and because he's got a purpose, he's driven, and he's gonna make it. Right. Uh, same thing with the rich kids. You know, you got I, I remember in high school that a girl was sitting up in in the lounge crying one day. And I was like, you know, it was, I was not in class. I should have been. But I was walking through the lounge. She cried. And, and Bishop, I asked her, why, why are you crying? She said, today is my birthday. And my mother bought me a, a white Trans Am or she says Trans Am. And my grandma bought me a Corvette. And I don't know which one to keep. And she was crying. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I'm thinking I can't even relate to this problem. You know, my first thing is like, are you serious? Right. But to her, it was a big problem, right? Wow. To the point where 
her the way that she solaced herself was with guys and 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 that's broken right very rich but very broken very broken interesting wow yeah so Keith, for you guys, what role has Christ uh, played in your life to develop you as a man? Both of you can ask that question, or a man or father, or both. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would. I would truly say, um, and this is, a, I think, a thing we should highlight always. Uh, anytime we share, is just this this connection, this re relationship that we're talking with Christ, where his spirit is constantly speaking. Not that we're hearing audible voices, but God is truly guiding you. I think, you know, when uh, the prophet said, it's like a still small voice. Um, or in Romans 8, he says, we received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And I'm, I only share that because it, Christ has brought a, a transformation to me. And I remember when I first gave my life to the Lord and I did it every day up until this day, I would get up in the morning, I'd look in the mirror. And even though I didn't have an earthly father, I would say, good morning, Father. You know, the word Abba, Father, for those who don't know, it's, it's basically a Hebrew expression of Papa or Dad. Daddy. Yep. And I remember someone, a uh, bishop like yourself, Again, sharing truth with me, share that theme with me that God wants you to be so close that you call him dad, or Abba Father. And so I began to ask the Lord, and this is from my brothers. I said, Lord, I don't know how to be a father. I, I mean, I literally have never had a father and seen any of my extended family father. So now here I am, I have these children. You know, how do I father them? Bishop talked about, you know, having to come out of himself emotionally to be that for his daughters. And I know, man, we get we get discouraged sometimes because I just don't know. And sometimes we feel like giving up. And then um, to be really transparent, I know our time is winding down, but to be really, really transparent with my brothers on the line. Um, you know, I've been married probably, uh, I've been married for 30, over 30 years now, but probably in my, my 15th or 16th year, man, my wife and I were going through a tough time. And, um, and the reason it was so tough is because I, I had this thing in my mind about this whole money thing. Like, you know, you grow up poor. I don't ever want to be poor again. So brother, just working and working and working and leaving the emotional aspect, the connection aspect. And you're just so caught up in what I'm doing that it, it, our relationship began to sever. And then you're doing ministry and you're doing all these things. We begin to Sever, and we, we went through a really bad time. And I remember I, I said to the Lord again, this is this relationship with our Abba Father. And, you know, my wife and I actually had, had split up for a little bit. Um, and I thought, Lord, how could that be? Like, all of my family, they look at me like I'm the one that has been married. Like, how can you even let this happen? And so God began to share with me. And I think this is just a good word to kind of close in terms of transparency because how God restored this thing, God began to share with me how to repent. Like how to, how to, how to, uh, if you look in the book of Nehemiah, when he began to pray, he prayed, Lord, we've done all these things against you. And as he prayed, he began to pray, we've turned our backs against you, we've done this against you. But the reality was Nehemiah actually had never done anything wrong, but he prayed as if he was the one who had totally sinned and missed the mark. And what he was doing was confessing and repenting and God was moving on his behalf to rebuild Israel, to rebuild the nation. And so I'm sharing that because as men, sometimes we don't know how to just acknowledge, you know, our shortcomings. And so I just begin to pray God, you know, and all the times maybe I didn't listen, but now give me an ear to listen. And all the times maybe I haven't been, compassion and help me to be compassion all the times maybe where I, I put my business in front of my family you know forgive me for that all the times maybe um you know I wasn't um you know as uh as you know as humble as I should have been or compassionate I should, and I'm just sharing this with my brothers just because when you begin to humble yourself and repent 
then it begins to bring forth an incredible move of the Holy Spirit on your behalf. And this Abba Father thing just can totally renew and transform your life, your family, your relationships, everything. And that's what it did with me. So anyway, I just had a lot to say about that, but it's just a blessing, Bishop. You know, Bishop, I have to say real quick that, I, you know, Keith, you never shared with me that that's the, what you do in the morning, but, you know, that's the first thing. I'm conditioned that way. When I wake up, my eyes come open. The first thing I say is, good morning, Father. Mm -hmm. And that's been mm -hmm. every morning for a, a couple of decades, at least, if not more than that. That's yeah. the first thing that comes to my mind. It's just a conditioning now. And uh, the only thing that I'll, I'll add to uh, what Keith talked about, because that, that's, that's the beginning, right? That relationship, that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Uh, one thing I will add is that God is going to have you do things that you don't want to do. That in your car, in your carnal body is saying, "I'm not going to do that, man." I, I, you know, people are going to think I'm, you know, I'm a mark, or people are going to think I'm a whip. There's going to be things that you're going to do that you are not going to, from the world worldly standpoint, going to agree with. But God is asking you to do it, and. Hmm. That's a lot of the things, that's, that's sometimes is the thing that's going to save those relationships. It's going yeah. to give you that increase that you've been saying, man, you know, I've been hearing that God is a God of increase and abundance. Where is it? Sometimes it's that laying it out on the line like that, doing things that you don't necessarily want to do. And I will leave this one real quick, Bishop, and I'm, you know, I'm going to turn it back over to you before we get to the end of the time, but you talked about chess earlier. And you and I have talked about this before where, the relationship with God is like a chess game. You know, the way that chess is played, if I move, then it's your move. And I can't move again until you move, right? And, and if you see how God interacted with the prophets throughout the Bible, he gave them a commandment. They moved, he moved. And that's the relationship wow. with God. He has you move, then he moves for you. And there's so many times, even, you know, ministers and People you think are really, really strong Christians, they keep saying, God's moving on my behalf. He's moving on my behalf. And where, when, when, you know, <laughs> but, but it's always a good thing. It's always this great thing. It's always God. But God is looking for us to have that transactional relationship. He moves, we move. He moves, we move. But guess what? Mm -hmm. That first move is ours. And that's Absolutely. a success to the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, but as you're speaking of, again, the choice, we have a choice to make. I made a choice uh, 43 years ago. Young Andreas was on the call, and he was a young, much, much younger man than, at the time. Uh, but I played ball with his uncles and who grew up in a community called Walnut Park. It's, it's like Beirut now. It was a whole different animal. But it was still back then, it was a lot going on. Uh, but I was one, one of the individuals that made a choice to uh, give my life to Jesus. That was 43 years ago. Uh, many of my friends died on those streets, went to prison, yeah. ended up on drugs yeah. and all that stuff. But I was one of the ones who made a decision because you know, the way I'm wired, either I'm in or out, black or white, so to speak. So once I locked in on that Friday night, uh, 43 years ago, and they know my story, dope in the car. And, you know, that night I've made a decision and I've been serving the Lord ever since. But to your point, I had to make a move. Mm -hmm. And that move perpetuated to me making more moves. And to this day, like Keith just said, uh, and you said every morning, I, I thank you, Lord, for another day. And so I start my day off out, brother, with making sure that I make that I let God know you're number one in my life. And that'll never change, let's be clear about that. But I had to make a move. And so I, I, I say to the brothers on the line, and, I, and I'm thinking about something was said about the young men. You know, what can we do to impact this generation? What can we do to really be a mentor to the folk in our local churches, I, you know, you all were speaking, and I frankly thought about what are we doing in our church, you know, currently to reach these young men. You know, we, we sometimes we spend time with men. We don't really target the young men like we should. And I think that's a challenge we all should take up on ourselves. And I, I thank God for Keith and him being in the schools. But I think the local church can do a better job, quite frankly, in reaching these young men because they need us. They need us. And I think it starts yeah. with us being relational 
and really showing an interest and uh, making sure we make ourselves available. So I thought that was great, Keith. You, you, you really yeah. uh, uh, provoked a thought in me as a leader. Well, guys, listen, it's, it's 6.59. Um, this has been uh, great. I hope you all have been blessed, empowered, inspired. Uh, we're excited about Keith. Uh, you, you being with us this coming Saturday morning, of course, breakfast starts, I think. What time does breakfast starts, brother? Help me out. Let's, help me out. Quick, tell us. What, give us, give us I think break. it said 9 to 11. Uh, probably at 9 o'clock. Probably yeah, at 9 o'clock. Okay, good. So breakfast, uh, we still got uh, time for you to, to, to register by your ticket for the for the brunch or the breakfast. And of course, Sunday morning, uh, Keith will be speaking again. So I'm excited about this week. I mean, I was excited about tonight. And I know this is not just us coming together, but we've been empowered tonight. I've been inspired uh, in a great way. Uh, I'll give you guys an opportunity, Keith and uh, Lou, to give final remarks. And Keith, you would please close us out in prayer. Sure. So Lou, I'll let you do the final remarks and then I'll close in prayer. Well, okay. So uh, my final remarks are going to be about Bishop Scott. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for your obedience to God. And that's what I've noticed about you when I met you that drew me to me, you, me uh, drew me to you was your obedience to God. And, uh, you know, what really struck me was how the, the, the church held church in the gym because Bishop Scott said he wanted to have a place for those brothers in that neighborhood to go and, and, and get that emotional deposit. You didn't say it in those terms, but that's what we were talking about tonight, right? Uh, mm -hmm. for the neighborhood to have somewhere to, to go and do that. And that's a person who's committed. Uh, so Bishop Scott, thank you for your platform and thank you for your obedience to God and thank you for making me a part of it. Glad to have you, sir. Thank you. And uh, Bishop, I want to thank you as well. And I want to thank all my brothers as well for taking time to just join us. As we know, time is so precious, especially when we got, as we talked in the beginning, all the other things coming at us, work, family, life, our energy and emotions and all these things. And then, you know, when we got high priority, like watching the basketball game and everything like that, <laughs> but God, God is good. So my word of encouragement that I'm going to pray as for my brothers is uh, first Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. It just simply says, be steadfast, unmovable. And the Amplified, it says doing more than enough, being Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. And so my brothers just continue in the battle, continue to move forward. If we faint in the day of adversity, our strength is small, but God has made us mighty and we're strong in him and strong in the Lord. So, uh, and I believe the breakthrough is coming for you, for your, for your business, for your children, for your job, for your relationships, it's coming. And so we, we agree together. So let me pray. Father, thank you so much for the brothers together and even those that I'll get a chance to meet uh, this coming week. Thank you for my brother Lou and Bishop as well. And Father, um, your word says it's good and it's pleasant for brothers to dwell together in unity. For it is like the oil that ran down the beard of Aaron. And then last of all, in that word in Psalms, Lord, you said, for there you commanded the blessing. And so that's my prayer today. It's just a commanded blessing on my brothers today. Father, we, we really desire great relationships, but it is, it is a battle and kings love battles and we love to win. So I pray that we, we would gird up our loins and we would win this battle. And I, I pray the commanded blessing on our children and our children's children. I don't know the age of all the brothers, but Lord, our children and our children's children, blessing and favor on them, Lord. Blessing and favor and wisdom on them. Father, this you know, is a wicked generation, but Lord, give them truth, give them light. And then I just pray peace over my brothers, over their homes, over their businesses, and just favor uh, over our relationship uh, with our brothers and sisters in church as well. Father, bless this time, bless this evening, and bless us as we come back together on our breakfast this coming Saturday morning and then worship together Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, brothers, let the kings arise. Amen. Amen. Uh, so amen. Listen, guys, the game starts at 8 o'clock. So amen. Listen, uh, I don't know who was pulling for who, but I need uh, Boston to beat Golden State tonight. I'm not a Boston fan. <laughs> 
but I mean, <laughs> neither am I a Golden State fan. So, but I need also <laughs> to beat them. I got a couple of guys in my church that wear Golden State underwear, so I need to. I need to. <laughs> 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 I need Boston to win. <laughs> hey guys, love you. Appreciate you. We'll see you Saturday morning. Uh, I'm excited, and uh, Keith, we we'll look forward to you and Louie as well. So y'all be blessed. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, gentlemen. God bless you. Hey, God bless you. you. Love you. It's, it's been a pleasure to meet you, gentlemen, man. It's That's really it. been a pleasure and an honor to meet you guys, man. And I'm looking forward to the breakfast Saturday to talk a little bit more about the topics we talked about today, but. I want to let you know, you know, I love my bishop and I love the BTWF family, man. So I love you, brothers, man. And it's my first night meeting y'all. So I'm looking forward to more and more greatness that we are about to step into in the men's ministry at the BTWF. Excellent. We'll see Amen. you. Amen. Hey, uh, we'll Bishop, you I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a phone call right after we, we sure. get off this line, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm awesome. just we're praying All right. for All your, right, your brother and your grandmother or grandfather? My grandmother and my brother. Man, listen, man, with our heart. Let's pray now. Father God, as we, we pray yes. for my brother, such a weight, such a load. We can't even imagine the pain he feels in his family in this most difficult time. But Father, we know by our own experience, you are a comforter and that you're certainly a friend. We ask you, God, look upon this family as your presence be known. Give him the peace that only you can give him. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're praying for you, man. We're praying for you, man. Yes, Amen. Bro, I, Amen. I know, I know the Thank you, Bishop. Yes, sir. Yes. All right, brothers, be blessed. All right. See y'all. Bless y'all. Be blessed.